On a hot night in 2002, a murder took place in this Philippines apartment. The victim was a British businessman. His death would transform the life of his mother. Only a mother will know what it feels like to lose a child. This part of your soul that just goes out like that, and it's just filled with pain, and it eats away at you all the time. Stephen is the best man in my life. This is the woman Margaret believes murdered her son. She's Stephen's widow, Evelyn. I loved you. He loved you. Your children loved you. And look what's happened. I don't know if I've ever seen All right. People of the Philippines versus Evelyn Davis. Evelyn is on trial in Manila. She's always protested her innocence, but her mother in law has spent two years fighting to get her in the dock. A life sentence is enough for me, I think. Death's too good. I've had my arms around this girl. I've cherished her, but she took my son. And she destroyed everything that was good in this world. So, Evelyn, did you kill Stephen? No. He was my perfect husband with me. In my, I have my two kids, and he, he, six years and a half, he was my the best man I ever had. He's a man. He was just a funny guy, very different. And funny meaning humorous. He would tell really bad jokes. But uh, then his grin or his smirk would, would make it funny. Didn't want her to fly, wouldn't hurt anybody. And that's how he came over. He was so gentle. Stephen grew up with two younger sisters in Nottingham. Things changed when his dad died. Stephen was just 14. He was quite a playful brother. And then when, when my dad had his accident and died, he became more, more of a bigger, more of a responsible brother. He just wanted to look after me and look after the girls. It became easier, actually, when Alan and I started seeing each other. And then Alan started to take Stephen on the, the male role, because I felt that Stephen had missed out quite a lot with trying to be such a, a good boy for me. We just clicked, really, which was really nice, because previous to that, life had been pretty tough for Stephen. I can remember thinking I wished he'd have got out a little more and parted and stuff, which he didn't tend to do, did he? He, he always, he was so taken with his computer and that's what he was gonna do with his life. While Stephen was getting his first job working in computers in Nottingham, his future bride, Evelyn, was growing up on the other side of the world. Samar is a remote island in the Philippines. You can only reach it by boat. There's no running water, electricity, or sanitation. She was a very good girl. She was very well behaved when she was young. She spent most of her time in the house. And when her father was ill, she did a washing and helped make mats to sell. She was very talkative, even when she was small. And when she was asked, what job do you want when you grow up? She'd say, oh, I want to be a bar girl so I can marry an American. When Stephen was 21, he was offered an exciting job abroad. A computer company promised to triple his salary if he left Nottingham to work in Hong Kong. I'd encouraged him so much because I felt that Stephen was um, 
very skilled, very intelligent, and could do an awful lot with his life. He was a bit innocent. Um, grew up, I think he grew up very close to his mother. That might not have been the best thing. Uh, he hasn't been on his own a long time. And, and I don't think Steve saw evil around him. Stephen took up a new hobby. He joined a flying club in Angeles City in the Philippines. Just two hours from Hong Kong, it's where many professionals come to party. He found himself surrounded by pretty women. Women liked him. He was very cute. You know, he had, he was a big guy with blonde hair, uh, you know, very uh, white face, uh, uh, smirk, good sense of humor. He made them laugh. And uh, women were attracted to him. Like Stephen, Evelyn decided to leave home for new opportunities. But she was only 13. I cried when she started working because she was very young. She said she had to work because we were very poor. It's a two-day journey by boat and bus to Angeles City. It's where many young girls like Evelyn come for work. Angeles is known as the sex capital of the Philippines. The bars here are the best opportunity for girls from the villages to earn money to send back to their families. They often lie about their age to get a job. In some of the bars, not this one, girls are as young as 12. They earn a pound a night for dancing, up to five pounds if they have sex with a customer. There is a premium rate for virgins, they're known as cherry girls. The bar owner keeps a watchful eye. He takes the lion's share of what clients pay. She was kind of embarrassed with what she was doing. She said she was forced into it. So she would use drugs to help her cope with the situation. The only way out for these girls is to get a wealthy boyfriend. Evelyn was one of the lucky ones. Her dream of being rescued by a rich man was about to come true. He said that he'd met this girl and that she was in one of the bars. I was naive at the time. I didn't know what I mean about the bars. You, you just think the pub, you know. And he was quite smitten with her. Stephen fell for Evelyn the moment he saw her. He took her out for the night, then paid the bar owner 500 pounds so she'd never have to return. Say hello. She said that Steve was kind and he was handsome and he wasn't old. He was young, like her. And also, she said that he had plenty of money. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Daddy. Were you shocked when you discovered that he'd bought a prostitute for the night? I was disappointed, very disappointed. But you have to be there to understand it. Um, some of these girls, I could have took home with me. They're really not, <laughs> not sexually, obviously. <laughs> As a mum, they're so pretty, so attractive, and they don't deserve to do what they're doing. He says, if you can rescue just one girl, from the bar life, he says, that's what I've done. I've rescued her from that life. What are you doing with me? Sit up. It's enough. 
Evelyn Davis is on trial in the Philippines for murdering her British husband, Stephen. She claims she is innocent. If I'm thinking with him now, all I can know is why. He's, he's so nice. He's so nice. It was on a visit to Hong Kong that Margaret met her son's new girlfriend for the first time. Hiya. Evelyn was just 17. Stephen was 10 years older. She's keeping her hands warm. I've got to be honest. You could see why he fell for her. Um, she was quiet. She was polite. She was just totally acceptable. Stephen arranged a special surprise for them. Oh, yeah. I'm convinced he only did it because he wanted to share part of his life with us. And he bought her a beautiful suit. I think he paid something like £500 for this little white suit. She looked lovely. I don't forget that day. It was, of course, it was like a nervous, you know, uh, a little bit. And yeah, it was very. Happy. The ceremony was held up because Evelyn couldn't read the vows. She'd never been to school. I just asked him if he knew what he was doing. I mean, there's a lot of stories about Western men marrying bar girls in the first place, um, and then marrying somebody so young and from such a you know, poor environment. I thought there was some you know, questionable uh, judgment on his part. I feel that he was feeling fairly safe in that relationship with Evelyn because he was the provider. And he held the purse strings. Yeah, and he, he must have felt that um, she, wouldn't, she wouldn't dump him because without him, Evelyn wouldn't have had anything. Margaret and Alan were flattered to be invited on Stephen and Evelyn's honeymoon. They went to the tropical island of Puerto Galera. Margaret was worried by what she saw. He loved her with everything he got. She didn't reciprocate that love, though, did she? No. Nah. We'd be walking down the road. Alan still holds my hand when we go down the road. And Stephen would try to hold Evelyn's, but she'd put her shoulder away. There's little things that mums notice sometimes. And Stephen tell me, she did, my mother-in-law, she doesn't want me to get married with him. Stephen said, Evelyn, I love her. And she's, she's the one that's going to be mother of my kids. <laughs> Stephen's hopes came true. First, Jessica was born. Then two years later, Joshua. The family moved from Hong Kong to Angeles City. It's where Evelyn had worked as a bar girl, earning a pound a night. Now, she was in a different world. They rented a house in the most expensive neighborhood. Stephen was earning 60,000 pounds a year as a computer technician. He gave Evelyn a monthly allowance of a thousand pounds. Nothing was too good for her. In fact, I'd tell him that his wife was lazy after she had the children, because she'd lie in bed all day and the maids would take care of the children. Yeah, Stephen employed maids to do the housework. And she wouldn't physically do anything. Um, and he'd just say, she doesn't have to do anything, Mum. She's my princess. She wasn't the same. She seemed to have this air of being rich, and she would always speak of money and in a way would look down on her relatives. It wasn't just Evelyn's life that was transformed. Life on the island changed dramatically for her parents too. Stephen was sending them large amounts of money. 
enough to buy a fishing boat and to build the only brick house in the village. He paid their fares to visit him and Evelyn in their new home. Sometimes they stayed for several weeks. When they'd gone, pillows would have gone missing or light Life bulbs and... or the rice maker. Um, anything they could come and carry away. Water filter, that went missing. Yeah, and Evelyn would feel it was OK because she'd just say to Stephen, we go buy some more. Margaret and Alan also visited at least once a year. They always took their video camera and they noticed their daughter-in-law was acting suspiciously. Whenever you saw her, she was text messaging, communicating with someone. When she thought you was out of earshot, there was, you could hear a giggle and a laugh. You said it was a boyfriend, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Just by her whole attitude towards us and towards Stephen, she was very angry at Stephen all the time by this time. Margaret and Alan weren't the only ones who suspected Evelyn was having an affair. Her sister, Gina, had moved into work as a nanny to the children. She confronted Evelyn about the rumours. She finally admitted that it was true that she did have a lover, and she told me that Steve and her were having problems. The man in question was a local security guard, earning only a thousand pounds a year. That was the same as Evelyn's monthly allowance. His name was Arnold Adorai. Were you having an affair with Arnold? No, I'm not having an affair with him. That's that's I don't know why why did he think me that way? One, two, Hello. three. Hello. Zoom in, Miles. Stephen was becoming increasingly suspicious about his wife's behaviour. Money was going missing. He'd given Evelyn the fees for Jessica to go to a private nursery school. One day, he decided to take his daughter there himself. He was really embarrassed because Jessie wasn't even enrolled. And there he is taking this little girl to school with a packed lunch. They didn't even know who she was. And the last thing he said to me was, um, she's really messed up this time, Mum, she's pawned a wedding ring. It's only um, in hindsight of, of the events, what happened, that she was actually buying things for her boyfriend. We did find out that the rent money bought him a motorbike. Stephen, too, started to spend time away from his family with his single friends. They went out to the bars and clubs he used to go to before he was married. I don't think Steve had an affair. I think he had one-night stands now and then. Uh, as I said, I, they, they didn't have a, a sexual relation whatsoever, so I think Steve would go elsewhere to satisfy that need. Stephen told Evelyn he was away on business. In fact, he was staying at Mike's house, where they brought girls back to party. This was the last home video Stephen recorded, weeks before his murder. Stephen still wanted his marriage to work. He gave Evelyn an ultimatum. She had to give the missing money back and get a job or go to college. But nothing changed, so he threatened her with divorce. She was faced with going back to being a prostitute in a bar. She would be exactly back where she was five years before, selling herself to strangers or living in poverty and back in her province after having been the queen. Stephen decided to stop Evelyn's allowance. Now she was no longer able to support the large network of family and friends that had come to depend on her. I do remember telling him uh, that he needs, he needs to be careful. You know, um, 
you know, some of these people are crazy. And uh, he made a comment, I'll never forget, he made a comment about, you know, um, that, uh, that they wouldn't hurt him because he's the golden goose, you see? And uh, I remember telling him that, you forget the moral of the story, is that they killed the golden goose. And uh, I think we just kind of laughed it off and had another beer. Margaret and Alan will always remember their last holiday with Stephen and his family. My anger with Evelyn, she let me say goodbye to Stephen that day. Knowing that we wouldn't see him again. It was, the, it was the way the goodbyes were. It wasn't like it had been in the past. It was a final goodbye. She, she was there. She knew. She knew. And she let him smile at us and hug us and, and say goodbye to us. She knew. July the 18th, 2002, Margaret got the news that every mother dreads. That particular morning, Alan and I were, were here on our own and Alan was doing the garden. And then um, I got a telephone call from Mike. It was like I'd heard it. And if I didn't say it, it wasn't true. And I just kept saying to Margaret, it can't be. He can't be dead. Not Stephen. That night, Stephen and Mike had been staying in Manila at their business apartment. Mike woke up when three men broke in. One held a gun to his head and said, is this him? When he was told no, he went into the room where Stephen was sleeping. At that point, I heard a yell and three or four shots. They were simultaneous. There was Steve's yell. He was yelling, hey, or something along those lines. But at the same time, there, there was these shots. Then I heard a running down the stairs. Uh, I went to Steve's room and I saw him lying there. I felt for a pulse. There was none. So I just went downstairs and, and went to the neighbors and called the police. And then I, I just said aloud to one of the neighbors, in fact, I just turned and said, that fucking bitch killed him. And I meant Evelyn. There was no evidence to link it to Evelyn. It was just pure suspicion. When Instant I said to murder. Mike, it was just a gut reaction. Has it got anything to do with Evelyn? I couldn't see it. I know she was arrogant and ignorant and all the other things we'd, we'd learned her to be. But a murderer, I couldn't see it. <laughs> As soon as Margaret learnt of her son Stephen's murder, she flew to the Philippines. At the funeral parlour, she thought his widow, Evelyn, was acting suspiciously. Evelyn was sat to the left as we walked in, and um, she didn't get up. And we went over to Stephen's coffin. Evelyn never came to us. Did she seem upset? No. Not at all? No. Not at all. Never saw a tear from that girl's eyes at Never, all. Never, ever. That time I saw my husband, he, he was just asleep. He was his hair is just like, you know, like that. And his old black hair and his very dark. I was, you know, nothing he can do with. And I got her to come over and we stood over Stephen. And she said to me, um, have you seen Mike? This is before we addressed that Stephen was lying there dead in front of us. Have you seen Mike? So I said, no, I've not seen anybody. 
And she said, well, if the guys were in the room for 20 minutes, surely he would recognise them. Mm. And she was just trying to put me about Mike. And that's when my notebook came out. And everything, every interaction we had, I made notes. The police investigation was moving very slowly. Their first theory was that someone connected with Stephen's company might have killed him. We started at their office, which is a few blocks away from their rented apartment. Uh, but all the employees are, are claiming that the victim is a very good employer. Uh, they don't uh, think of anybody who would do that to him. They are really facing a blank wall then. Margaret took things into her own hands. She wasn't going to return to the UK until she had got to the truth about Stephen's murder. She hired her own private investigator, a former policeman who doesn't want to be identified. She's crying and gave me a hug, she's crying on my shoulder and telling me, oh, please help my son's case to be solved. Margaret's investigator carried out 24-hour surveillance on Evelyn. There were two men who paid regular visits to her home. One was Evelyn's lover. The other, his friend, another security man. Margaret passed this on to the police, who called both men in. Mike was able to identify them as two of the three men who broke into his flat on the night of the murder. At one point, he looked towards me, and I saw his eyes. And those are the same eyes that were, you know, going to gun me down. I, I was 100% certain. They were both arrested. But Margaret's campaign to hunt down Stephen's killers was putting her and Alan's lives at risk. She was warned that they were in danger. Friends of the accused knew who they were. After two months, it was time to go home. But Margaret wasn't going to leave the Philippines without something of Stephen's his children. She wanted to take Jessica and Joshua home to live with her and Alan. Why did you decide that it was the right thing to take them away from their mother? Because she was dangerous. She didn't care. Coffee. Is your coffee, Jessie's coffee? Margaret persuaded Evelyn to let Jessica stay with her for the weekend. A few days later, she left the Philippines for England with her three-year-old granddaughter. She hadn't been able to find her grandson. I didn't want to leave Joshua. It was the hardest thing I did is to leave the baby there without taking him. So we left the passport for Joshua and we had to get on the plane with Jess. And by this time I'd got halfway down my list because I'd got Jessica. I got the passports, I got Stephen's ashes in my hand luggage. We got two guys in jail and um, was exhausted. Next on Margaret's list was her grandson. Joshua was staying with Evelyn's parents. Margaret sent her investigator to the island with an offer of £200 to hand him over. I cried. I cried over the child. He was going far away. But I couldn't do anything because I don't have the money for his schooling. Whatever he wants to study, it's better if he is with the other grandmother, Margaret. She has plenty of money. There he can study and choose whatever course he wants and finish his education. Two months after she fled the Philippines, Margaret was reunited with her grandson at Heathrow Airport. He was dressed in a pair of men's socks, a baby girl with the legs cut off because he didn't fit him, and a British Airways nappe. It was amazing. Just have Stephen's son in my arms, after all what we've been through. Evelyn has not seen her children now for two years. Let's go into the They're living house. with Margaret and Alan. Okay. Hungry Harris! <laughs> Are you my princess? Yeah. 
you are, aren't you? I hug my, my daughter and give her love. <laughs> and I'm never gonna say again. I'm never gonna say it again. The laugh of my kids, I mean, she knows that I love my kids. She knows and that my life, it was just my kids and my husband, she knows that. Even though Margaret was on the other side of the world, she was determined to prove her daughter-in-law's guilt. For two years, she worked every single day and often throughout the night getting evidence. It was a costly business. She even had to pay the police's petrol money to interview witnesses. Altogether, she spent 55,000 pounds. She wanted justice and I think she was enraged at Evelyn that she could cold bloodedly kill her husband and then just behave the way she continued to behave, all for money. It was Evelyn's relatives that gave Margaret the breakthrough she needed. Whilst out there, she and Alan had made friends with them. They'd kept in touch by text message. I promised her I would do anything I could to help her. She said, thank you. I said, I understand, because we are both mothers. The family held the key to what happened to Stephen that night. And this man was to provide the crucial evidence. He's Robin Butus, Evelyn's brother-in-law and Gina's husband. He'd been acting suspiciously since the killing. When the police tried to question him, he went into hiding. Evelyn's aunts knew where he was and Margaret persuaded them to turn him in. Finally, he admitted that he'd been the third man on the night of the murder. At last, the truth was out. It was around 11 o'clock when Evelyn came and asked me to go with them. I didn't know where we were going. I got into the car and then we headed downtown. Robin told the police that Evelyn's lover, the friend, and Evelyn then drove to the flat where Mike and Stephen were staying. The three men got out of the car and went upstairs. Evelyn's lover was the one who fired the gun. Two shots, then two more. Evelyn sat in the car to act as lookout. Evelyn told everybody that Stephen was a millionaire and she would get all Stephen's money when Stephen was dead. Robin's confession meant that Evelyn's lover and his accomplice were convicted of murder. They are both serving life sentences. Robin was set free in return for providing evidence. In February 2004, Evelyn was arrested and charged. Even though she didn't fire the gun herself, she can still be found guilty of murder. The judge will decide if she planned Stephen's death with her lover. Evelyn denies everything, but there is strong evidence against her. The men had a key to get into the apartment. On the night of the murder, Evelyn claimed she was asleep at home, yet a neighbor saw her come back in the early hours of the morning. There are 14 people giving evidence against Evelyn, but there is not a single witness to support her version of events. Yes, Your Honor. No corroborating witness? None, Your Honor. Makati City Jail is where prisoners are held on remand. Evelyn's been here for seven months. The only visitor she's had is her father. The rest of her family's turned against her, and they have given evidence that they heard her and her lover planning to murder Stephen for his money. In six weeks' time, the judge will announce his verdict. The penalty for murder in the Philippines is a life sentence, or even execution by hanging. It's such a shame what has happened to her, that she has wrecked her life and allowed herself to be carried away by a Dorai. I guess I, I, I don't want to waste my energy hating her. I mean, she did what she did, she deals with it. 
I, I, I feel the loss of a friend. The upsetting part for me is knowing that you, I won't see him again. And also for his children, that they won't have that opportunity. And I think that's the saddest thing. Because he loved his kids, he was so proud of them. Where's the magic words? Please. It's your favourite, sweetie. And Joshua's going to grow up to be a big dinosaur. I come out of my house with Jessica and it's, look at that star up there, isn't it a beautiful star? And I say, yes, yeah. she says, that's my daddy. That's my daddy. You know, and it really cuts you. Margaret's goal is in sight. The judge is about to pronounce his verdict on Evelyn. And Margaret is determined to be there. It's been a very long, long journey. It's been two and a half years. It's been a hard journey, um, a day in, day out journey. And I just hope that um, I can get some resolve and focus on the children and bring the children up and do all the things that Stephen would want us to do. It's going to be a huge day if we get the right verdict. It's going to be a huge sigh of relief. Evelyn is about to find out if she will be set free or convicted of murdering her husband. Stephen's mother, Margaret, and her partner, Alan, have waited two and a half years for this moment. I didn't see her coming. Yeah. With no family or friends to support her, the only person for Evelyn to talk to is her lawyer. Case number 022292, People of the Philippines versus Evelyn Davis. Decision is positive portion. Wherefore, this court hereby finds Evelyn Bohol Italawagan, also known as Evelyn Bohol, Evelyn Bohol Davis, and Dianita Bohol Davis, guilty beyond reasonable doubt of murder, qualified by treachery without any mitigating or aggravating circumstances and sentences her to suffer the penalty of reclusion perpetua. Together Evelyn has been spared the death penalty, but she's got the maximum life sentence. That means 40 years in prison, with no possibility of an early release. All right, any more case? The court is Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very well. Uh, were you satisfied that she was just given a resolution for I don't get any pleasure in seeing my daughter-in-law going to prison. Mm -hmm. And no matter what happens, it would never bring my son back. But there's no pleasure in seeing Evelyn go to prison. None at all. Margaret has one last task before she leaves. She's going to confront Evelyn with her crimes and say goodbye. Does she want to talk? OK. Stand up, Evelyn. Stand up and talk to me, Evelyn. <coughs> Take off those glasses. Look at me. Your daughter cries for you. Your son cries for you. They want their mummy. And you don't want them. I want Jesse and Joshua, you, you know that. You do want them. No, you know that. I want Jesse and Joshua, you know that. But how, how, can you, how can you convince me of that? Whatever happened with Stephen, I don't know. You know that, Mum. I was there with Stephen. Everything what happened with Stephen, when he's dead, I was there and I go to the hospital when I know when someone called me and I, I was crying. But your boyfriend, it was your boyfriend. I don't never get, I, I, I don't, I never have a relationship with him. Even if I die now. I have a perfect love, I have beautiful Jessica and I have beautiful Joshua in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you lying? Stephen is the best man in my life. It is mine. You're a stupid girl, Evelyn. You're a stupid girl. I have done anything wrong. He loved you. I loved you. He loved you. Your children loved you. And look what's happened. I don't have done anything with Stephen. My daddy knows what has happened that night. Evelyn continues to deny everything. Margaret had hoped she might confess, but she's disappointed. You can see my eyes, Mum, if I'm telling lie. I wish, I wish, I wished it was a lie, Evelyn. If it was different, Evelyn, I wished it was different. I wished it was just you and the children. But it's not. I bring you some pictures. Is Mummy crying from Jessica? It's Joshua. That's the house with the blue gates, the house she lived with Stephen. And this one is Jessica, Mummy and Nana. She's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. He's beautiful. Do you know, Evelyn, I don't even feel <coughs> angry at you. I just feel so sorry. So sorry that we had some... In there you'll see some happy days. Thanks for being here for you. Thank you for being here. All the family, because this was your family. I send you pictures of them growing up. They'll always know they have a very beautiful mummy. And they'll always be your children. Always. So I'm going now then. Do you want to stand up and say goodbye to me, Evelyn? No? Okay. I'm going. You got your wish to have a face to face with her, to talk to her. That's what you wanted all along. That's what you got.
Dear Evelyn, you were convicted in court of the murder of your husband Stephen with the help of Arnold Dora, your boyfriend. Nothing you say will convince me that you're innocent. I'm leaving you and the Philippines knowing justice has been done and you will spend the next 40 years in jail. You'll be an old woman with a wasted life. You had everything. Stephen called you his princess and loved you very much. You are a very evil woman with no thought of the lives you have ruined, and I hope the sacrifice of your family was worth the short time of the love of Adorai. You took my son, now I have yours, and your daughter, who someday will come and ask, why, Mummy, why was you so bad and leave us? and kill our daddy. I will enjoy your children and we shall have some happy times and not think of you. I will never forgive you or see you ever again. You are no longer a daughter of mine, Margaret. <laughs>